Good afternoon, uh, Tasmania from a sunny town school, Queensland. Uh, thank you, Matt, uh, for the opportunity to present uh, some of the work we've done uh, together uh, uh, when you were in Townsville. So uh, this talk is about knee alignment in total knee replacement beyond the coronal planes um, analysis of uh, 4,000 odd knees. Um, declaration, I've got nothing to declare in regards to this presentation. So I'm going to start off uh, this uh, conversation uh, uh, with uh, uh, you uh, stating some important facts with regards to the new replacement that we have. A very successful operation. Um, the numbers are increasing at a rate of 5% uh, per annum. Um, we think we are doing very well, but in fact, we have a 20% uh, dissatisfaction rate. And this is an important point. The orthopedic literature currently has been riddled with a different alignment philosophy. And um, what, what uh, that is seem to be focusing on these philosophies is the alignment in coronal plane, mainly in extension. The other fact is that implant designs have not necessarily kept up uh, with the uh, recent changes or introduction of new alignment philosophies and surgical techniques. And uh, the question is, can the static single phase alignment parameter with traditional implants solve the dissatisfaction problem? And if, if the answer to that is no, uh, then what else is there that we need to look at? And hopefully this uh, paper will give you some insight into what we've been thinking about, why this dissatisfaction rate may still persist uh, despite the fact that uh, we are introducing newer techniques in, into what we are doing with new replacement. Without going into detail, multiple literature uh, that has been published on this topic, I'm just going to pick this one paper that has been published early this year by our friends in uh, Sydney. If it looks like if it looks at the classification of the coronal plane alignment of knee, and basically what they've done is they've taken the arithmetic formula, uh, which uh, talks about the constitutional HKA, which is the hip knee angle of a knee, equates to the uh, medial proximal tibial angle minus the lateral distal femoral angle. And they've divided uh, the uh, knee morphologies into nine different subtypes. And what they did was they looked at the outcomes uh, uh, with regards to the balancing of the knee with the newer techniques and compared them with the mechanical alignment. But if you note what I've highlighted in yellow here, that, that their primary end or the primary outcome measure was extension. So it was near full extension, 10 degrees was chosen as the angle for the primary outcome because the methodology for calculation of constitutional alignment is based on coronal plane alignment, which is basically in extension. Now, the secondary outcomes were uh, looking at uh, the classifications of the knee and at 10, 45 and 90 degrees. And if you go deeper into this paper and look at uh, the uh, results, they found that they were very consistent with balance and alignment and extension. But when it came to the flexion alignment and flexion balance, there, there was a significant variation with uh, the standard deviation much higher than that they found in the extension alignment. So basically this technique and this classification focuses on the extension alignment and extension balance and doesn't disregard the flexion alignment and balance, but that's not the primary uh, um, um, motivator for this study and nor for the surgical technique. So what else is out there? So we looked at these CT scans and we, we tried to look at uh, uh, all the other alignment parameters that, that affect the outcomes in the knee replacement. So the first question, what about flexion alignment? So what's the alignment of the knee when the knee is flexed in 90 degrees? What happens to the trochlear alignment? What happens to uh, the rotational alignment of the knee? And how about the sagittal alignment? So the last three that I'm mentioning here, trochlear, rotational, and sagittal, they seem to be very interrelated. And as, this, as I go through this paper, hopefully it becomes a bit clear uh, what we are trying to refer to with this particular slide that you see on your, on your screen at the moment. So the, in, going on from that slide, the important statement is that when we do the knee replacement, we essentially affect three cuts. And these uh, cuts are to appropriately balance and align the knee. Now, 
pitch cut has more than one effect on the overall alignment and balance of the knee. So it's a bit like a game of chess. When you have when you make one move, you're thinking of two or three moves ahead. So here, when you, for example, cut the distal femur, it, it not only has a, a effect on the alignment in extension, but also has an effect on the balance of the knee and also has an effect on the trochlear alignment as you valgize or verize the distal femur, uh, the uh, trochlear uh, alignment uh, changes. And hopefully uh, I'll, I'll go through that in a bit more detail. Now, Going back to our study, uh, this is a study uh, that uh, looked at the arthropometric data from 4,116 arthritic knees. And we have analyzed the impact of these morphological variances on uh, the new surgical techniques and the current implant design. So the method of the CT scan assessment was uh, 4,000 odd knees. Uh, they were um, uh, um, done for preoperative data was extracted from the 360 knee system database, which is a company out of Sydney that's, that does preoperative planning of, for a knee replacement. All these knees were preoperative arthritic knees. The 360 knee system software proprietary algorithm was used to generate specific angle measurements that were included in the study for anatomic morphology results. So I'm just gonna take you through what parameters uh, uh, and what me measurements we actually looked at. The first is a HKA, pretty simple. The next one is a um, medial proximal tibial angle. Again, pretty uh, straightforward. The third one is a medial lateral distal femoral angle, which is essentially a, a line drawn tangential to the uh, mechanical axis of the femur. Uh, and we looked at the medial proximal uh, um, posterior tibial slope, and then we also looked at the lateral uh, tibial posterior slope. These two are very important. We looked at the trochlear angle to the distal femoral angle, and we also looked at the trochlear angle to the posterior condylar axis. So these are uh, the um, seven parameters that we looked at, and we tried to analyze the data that uh, came from this, from 4,000 knees, and see how, what, how they impacted uh, the uh, knee replacement philosophies. So he, here we have the HKA, when we look at the average is approximately minus four out of this 4,000 odd knees with a plus or minus 5.5 degrees. So if you, if you look at one standard deviation, we are sitting around this point and all these patients are outside the standard deviation. There's a fair few patients that don't necessarily fit into what we would call the normal range, plus or minus, you know, one standard deviation. And as you can see, the spread is rather large. It goes from minus 22 to uh, plus 18. However, it has, I, granted, and I can see that these are arthritic knees that we're going to near replacement so therefore there could be element of bone loss so the extreme uh, um, numbers uh, need to be accounted for as a limitation of this study so when we look at the proximal tibial angle once again you know now i've drawn these red lines to show two standard deviations and approximately 20 percent of patients are outside of the range of what we would what you would call normality and once again there's a significant range of plus 20 valgus to minus 18 varus so the importance of this uh, um, results is looking at the outlier patients and how their anatomy uh, a, is not accounted for by the usual surgical techniques and implants that we have. So here's uh, the third parameter, which is the lateral distal femoral angle. Once again, if you look at the range, it's plus 12 to minus 12, average of plus three, most common angle was plus uh, two and plus three valgus with 16% of the knee and the medial angle was plus three. So though most patients lie in a valgus alignment of the trochlea, there are some patients that are actually varus. So if, if, you, if you look over here and, and, and this is being zero at this point and there are a certain number of patients that are actually varus. Now you're looking at the uh, TA, which is a trochlea angle to the distal femoral angle, once again, this is just the uh, uh, two standard deviation parameters that I've, I've drawn there. And 23.8 um, uh, degrees varus to 30 degree valgus is the range, which is quite a significant range, an average of 1.6 uh, valgus, uh, plus or minus six. 60% of knees had valgus. 
but there were 39% of knees that had a varus, so therefore they were medial. Uh, if, you, if you look at the current implant designs, uh, the trochlear angles are always valgus, you know, anything ranging from seven to 14 degrees, depending on, on what exactly um, the implant size is, and it, and it slightly changes in different implants. We're looking at the uh, trochlear angle to the PCA, the, the range being minus 13 to plus 23, the average of uh, plus 2.2, which is valgus, 72% or 73% of patients um, uh, had a lateral uh, trochlear angle to PCA with a mean of plus four, and 27% of the knees actually had a medial. So 30% of knees were actually had a medial. Once again, this goes back to the fact that uh, uh, all, most uh, trochlear angles of implants are valgus. So I'm just gonna quickly talk about the PFJ impact of the, uh, the, the parameters that I have just discussed, which uh, basically it is the trochlear angle to the DFA and also to the PCA. So this is a software that I've been using to preoperatively look at my trochlear angles, native versus prosthetic. So if you look at the blue line on, on, on this uh, image, it represents a native trochlea and the distal condylar coronal and posterior condylar axis lines. And the red line represents the prosthetic trochlea. So if you look at the left side over here, this is a active screen where I am allowed to change various valgus of the distal femur or the tibia, depending on what I choose over here. In this case, it's the distal femur and the rotation of the, of the femur. As you can see, this is a, a, a distal femur position 0.6 of varus uh, with internal rotation of five degrees and a, a slope of, uh, sorry, a flexion angle of, of three. And if you look on this side, this gives you the variation between the trochlear angle of the prosthesis and the native trochlear angle. So if you, if you look at uh, the um, uh, native, or not the native, but the prosthetic uh, angle, I'm just using a tune as an example. If you look at the attuned trochlear angles, in the most commonly used um, prosthesis, four, five, and six, the angles lie anything between 12 plus or minus one, so in a 13 to 11 degrees. And as the prosthetic size increases, the trochlear angle decreases because the Q angle it, it decreases. So uh, essentially for a given prosthetic size, the trochlear angle is static in a given prosthesis. So when you are going to um, change the uh, component position, then you can see that as you valgize or varize the component, the native trochlea will remain the same. However, the prosthetic trochlea will change. So for example, if you were to valgize this component to three degrees, you have got a, uh, on this side, as you can see, you, you have got an angle between the component and native trochlear angle of plus two. So there's still a variation, which is not too bad. And you have got inflection, a, a, a difference of 0.5 degrees. So you can manipulate the distal femoral angle to accommodate and make the prosthetic angle as close to the native trochlear angle as possible. But when you look at some of the patients that are so variable, they're so outside of the outlier patient, this may not be possible. And the limitations is one, the surgical technique, and two, more so the implant design, uh, which is a problem. And so therefore you have to compromise. And the compromise comes in multiple uh, forms where you have to do soft tissue releases, you have to do lateral releases, or maybe even taking some of the distal femoral angle, uh, which onto the tibial side, so as not to violate the trochlear uh, uh, anatomy and the patellofemoral stability. So here's another, uh, um, just an, another, another example of a, of, of, a, of a patient that we have put in a mechanical alignment of zero, zero degrees. And you can see that there's a significant variation in extension of six degrees and inflection of two degrees. Once again, this trochlear angle uh, of the patient is various. So therefore you have an issue where you're trying to uh, um, match a valgus trochlear angle of the implant to a various native anatomy. And once again, the two issues, one is the implant design and the second being the actual surgical technique. 
Now we're looking at uh, the uh, posterior uh, tibial slopes. And if you look at the medial and the lateral, and if you look at the differences between the two slopes, that's where the importance is. So if you look over here, um, so I'm just gonna go back very quickly on this screen. If you, if you look over here, there are differences between the posterior uh, uh, tibial slope between the medial and the lateral side. 23% are between three and five, 12% are between five and seven degrees, 7.3, seven and 10, and um, approximately 3% are greater than, uh, greater than 10. So approximately, if you look at this figure here, it's about 20, 22, 23 odd percent of patients that are outside of five degrees. Now, what, what does that mean? As you know, that the slope of the of the tibia has an impact on the flexion balance. Here's a paper that looked at uh, the impact of uh, the changing um, tibial slope. For every five degrees on the flexion uh, a gap was approximately two millimeters in a CR knee and one millimeter in a PS knee. So if the tibial slope changed, the native tibial slope changed by five degrees or more, you, you had a minimal change of two mils for a CR and one mil for a PS knee. So as, as I mentioned before, 22.6% of patients were outside of five degrees, so minimal difference in a PS knee of one and in a CR knee of of two. So if, if you're going out here, 3% of patients will actually have more than could be in a CR, CR knee of four millimeter gap or balance difference. So what's the overall impact of sagittal tibial uh, uh, difference in, in the posterior slope? In order to balance the knee, the femoral component will have to be rotated. Uh, only possible in tibia first technique. The femur is rotated away from the side uh, with greater slope or towards the side with the lesser slope, depending on which slope was matched with the resection. The femur should be rotated pivoting on the opposite condyle. This maneuver has an effect on the PFJ due to femoral rotation and derotation and the overall flexion alignment. So here I am going to introduce the concept of flexion alignment. Okay, so when you, this is uh, um, uh, when you're doing a navigated knee, you have the uh, um, um, operative uh, uh, kinematic curves, and this is a preoperative curve, that's the postoperative curve, and as you can see, I have tried to match the two curves. As the knee goes from extension to flexion preoperatively, it went from uh, a valgus to a slight sort of varus, so it, it sort of curve towards the varus. And as I corrected the uh, uh, cartilage loss and, and tension the ligaments, the knee went from the same position of valgus to slightly more varus. And this is just uh, looking at the, 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 the curve and matching the curve post-operatively. So there are five kinematic curves that I have identified uh, throughout uh, uh, the uh, practice of doing kinematic or uh, non-mechanical knee replacement. The first one is straight. Straight meaning it between plus or minus three degrees in extension and goes down to flexion. Then you, you, you've got the two curves that go from valgus to varus, which started life in valgus and came to varus, or started life in varus and went fur further varus. And on the opposite side, uh, valgus to valgus, so started life in valgus and went further valgus and started life in varus and came, came to valgus. Now, these are real curves. So that what happens here is, is that um, you have... Uh, um, the concept of flexion alignment takes into consideration each five kinematic curves which dictate the rotation of the soft tissue around the bony anatomy. Very important concept. So what are the limitations of this study? All assessments done on arthritic knees, as I mentioned before, and this, this paper is not necessarily correlated with outcomes. And there is, there is plans to correlate this study with uh, outcomes, but that's another paper in it, just in itself. So as far as conclusion goes, existing arthroplasty techniques are based on assumptions that make use of averages. However, there is significant variability present in the population. This study demonstrates the variation within arthritic knees when examining alignment outside of coronal plane with 14% of uh, the uh, trochlear angle to DFAs and 5.2% of TA to PCA being greater than 10 degrees, which sometimes can lie outside of what the implant can accommodate for. Additionally, 22.6% of patient cohort had differential PTS, which is posterior tibial slope greater than five degrees. Once again, this has an effect on the flexion alignment and also the balance of the knee. So when you have patients that are lying in the outlier range, you need to be aware of their native anatomy and try and match 
match the uh, new replacement to their native anatomy for better outcomes. So final thoughts on this uh, uh, study is that um, whether newer surgical techniques are mismatched with the traditional implants and outlier patients, could this mismatch have a significant contribution to satisfaction rates amongst this select population? So um, having said that, uh, I thank you all uh, for your attention and thank you, Matt, for the opportunity to present this paper. I hope that this paper has given you some insights into how we can work together to look at uh, where the deficiencies in the surgical techniques and implant designs lie and more research needs to be done to come up with techniques and implant designs to match uh, the outlier patients. Thank you.